From a distance, the Obi River is a picture of beauty. It's a stream Mabel Cox has known almost all her life. We used to come down here a lot for baptismal service, and we'd stand on the steel bridge up where all of us kids would line up there so because we could see what was going on. And on a warm June afternoon, its cool currents give her family some relief from the heat. But Mabel knows these rippling waters hide a dirty secret. Years ago, this river was orange, you know, has a lot of orange sulfur in it. Yeah, I don't remember any fish in this river. The problems for the Obi started back in the 1800s, as railroads made the mountains of the Cumberland Plateau more accessible. This mining that started in this region kind of migrated down the plateau all the way down to Dunlap as a significant part of the industrial effort here. That was also combined with timber operations that went after the high quality timber all along the plateau. Near the river, miners from the Wilder camp and also from Davidson worked to pull coal from the earth. It was a tough life lived by hardworking people who more often than not were just trying to survive. The coal that was mined in this area was from the Wilder Seam. That Wilder Seam of coal was very high in sulfur and iron. Folks went in and got the coal and didn't worry too much about the environment. That was an extra cost. It was a cost that ended up being paid by the Obi. Iron pyrite exposed to air and water by the mining operation created acidic water that flowed into the river, killing almost everything that lived there. This river was dead. The acid in this water was so high it would not support aquatic life. Maybe some forms of bacteria, but other than that, would not support aquatic insects or fish. For most people, the Obi was a lost cause. I mean, how do you go about bringing life back to a river that is essentially dead? The key is to identify the greatest sources of pollution and then fix them one at a time. This water may look crystal clear, but don't be deceived. This is acid mine drainage. The water that emanates from these acid mine drainage seeps is typically high in acid, low in pH, and high in suspended metals. Iron, manganese, aluminum, all kinds of things that are not good. Tim Eagle with the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation is testing water seeping out from an old surface mine. While the deep mines at Wilder and Davidson may have been the start to the Obi's problems, they aren't the only source. In the 1960s and 70s, before it became regulated, surface mining on the plateau was widespread, profitable, and damaging. We didn't know we had acid producing materials in the spoil. Mining the coal essentially created a rock basin, kind of like a giant bowl in the ground. The leftover material, or overburden, which contains the iron pyrite, was then used to fill the bowl. Add some rainwater to trigger the oxidation process, and that giant bowl begins filling up with sulfuric acid, eventually making its way to the surface through seeps like this one. Sulfuric acid dissolves the metals that are in the dirt, put them into suspension, transport them downstream until it hits a point in the receiving stream where the pH comes up enough, then they start falling out. I'm looking at a pH that's very close to four. The lower the pH, the higher the level of acid. Ideally, the water would be neutral with a pH reading around seven. We want to capture the acid mine drainage seeps that are coming from the old coal mines, retain the water in an alkaline situation for as much as 14 hours if we can. To reclaim the water, Tim and Tdeck are using limestone-lined retention ponds. Holding the water here allows the limestone to react with the acid, neutralizing it and raising the pH before the water flows into the river. At this point, some of these metals can fall back out of suspension, and I suspect what you see here is the aluminum on these rocks, which is coming out first. That means cleaner water and a healthier stream. Well, you know there's some reproduction because we're seeing all these smaller fish. While there is still much to be done, after more than 15 years of hard work... There we go. Bluegill. Fantastic. The Obi is beginning to heal. We're seeing fish and we're seeing crayfish, so that's definite improvement from what it has been. 
We're finding stonefly larva, caddisfly larva. This is a helgramite larva. You don't see them in polluted waters very much. Here's a largemouth bass and a bluegill. We see different age classes of fish. That means that they're uh, propagating themselves and living over several generations. A new generation of fish to be cared for by a new generation of people working to right the mistakes of the past. They ought to care because mankind has uh, messed up the integrity of this, this river. We, we ought to try to undo what our forefathers did if they've made mistakes. We ought to try to reclaim it. The scale of what we were attempting up here led a lot of people to believe that restoring this river was kind of a fool's errand but we have been successful and when we finish this project, you'll have a river that will be an asset to the state instead of a liability. And something Mabel Cox will be glad to pass on to future generations. I love this river, I always have. I brought my children and then I brought my grandchildren. Now these are my great grandchildren and I hope this river keeps running until they bring their children. I'm Ken Tucker on Tennessee's Wild Side.